Turks. Wave after wave of Mongolian people have poured out of this country of Mongolia. As you can see, it has no sea coast, but what you might not know is it has very little rainfall. And its people will multiply fast. I mean, they live like nomads. I mean, they are nomadic people. They can multiply pretty fast. They almost all the land gets to where it can't hold them. And they will up and move. And most of the time, they have moved into Western Europe. Now, at times, they have moved into China. But they've had to leave their country. We talked already about the Huns, who were the first group Bob we know of, who left and came here and eventually established, established the country of Hungary. But now we're talking about the Turks, two groups of Turks, the Seljuk Turks and Ottoman Turks. They came, and the Turks might very well have put it into Islam. Except for one thing, they were a lot like the Arabs and the fact that they were nomadic peoples. You know, the Arabs tended to be more stable, live around oasis. The, uh, these people were wanderers, nomadic wanderers, more so than the Arabs. Anyway, they found a liking to Islam, and they converted to Islam. Otherwise, they might have put an end to Islam for good. But they converted. But there was one problem. When they converted, they stopped the infighting that had been going on between Sunni and Shiite. They bought, so temporarily stopped it. They temporarily bought some peace to the region. But they established such a rigid interpretation of the Quran that it stifled innovation, stifled change, made adaptation difficult, and to some extent their influence is still felt to this day. They simply would not budge, would not change. With all due respects, they were somewhat of a barbaric people, looked on as being barbarians by both European and by both Christian and Muslim, European also. Um, the Ottoman Turks came in after the, but uh, well, the Ottoman Turks came in last, after the Seljuk Turks. And in 1453, they captured Constantinople. And they put an end to the Byzantine Empire. Now, it took them a while. I mean, they first came in around the year 1000. It took them almost 450 years to capture Constantinople. And one reason it took so long was the Byzantines had a weapon called Greek fire. Now, folks, this sounds fantastic, I'm sorry, but here's the story they tell about Greek fire. Many of you heard of Greek fire? All right, a couple of your heads are nodding. According to the story, that once it touched anything, there was no way to put it out. Now, for instance, the uh, Muslims invaded the Byzantines with wooden ships. Of course, that was all they had. But the Byzantines would set these wooden ships on fire, the Muslim ships. And according to the story, these ships would continue to burn even as they went to the bottom. The, even the ocean would take a long time for the ocean to eventually put the fire out. But uh, they would keep burning. We have to wonder, well, what kind of fire would still burn under water? Either the ancients exaggerated. But it is true that any time, if you've been around in, and some Greek fire touched your body anywhere, you were going to die. Rolling over in the dirt would not quench it. It was going to spread throughout the rest of your body anyway. Uh, it, and there have been folks who have said that Greek fire was a mixture of sulfur and uh, possibly tar. Tar and sulfur mix. Maybe tar and something else mixed. We don't know for sure what. And folks, there have been persons who have speculated that Greek fire was a crude form of a dirty bomb, a nuclear reactor. We don't know that it was kept super secret. And at one point, even it's known that a Muslim man had the secret. But it was kept super secret. And finally, it's believed that the last man who knew the secret died. And the secret died with him, unless somebody somewhere knows the secret today. But it was, it was a secret weapon that the uh, Islamic, I mean, by the, the Byzantines used to hold off the Turks for a while. Now, even in 1453, when the Turks besieged Constantinople, the um, Byzantine people used Greek fire. But by this time, the Byzantine army consisted of a mere 5,000 men. And the Turks had more than 100,000 men. So just by sheer force of numbers, the, um, the Greeks were overcome. 
because the Greeks, so why the Byzantines. The Byzantine Empire was sometimes called Greek. Now, which takes me up to the Crusades. The Crusades lasted about 200 years. I don't know, I'll, I'll give the dates. The dates were from 1095 to 1290, you know, it was 195 years. All told, there were about 200 individual movements that could be called Crusades. But of those, only nine are really important enough that we try to remember them. There was the First Crusade, Second, Third, Fourth, up to the Ninth Crusade. Then after the Ninth Crusade, there were other attempts to... Uh, what brought the crusading the spirit about was that among the Europeans, there were rumors going around... Uh, well, back up a bit. A lot of Europeans would go visit these sites in the Holy Land where Jesus had lived and where David had lived and Solomon. And there were rumors going around that uh, the Muslims would beat up and rob Christian pilgrims on their way to these holy sites. Your book tries to downplay that. I mean, your authors are, of course, this, this book was written about three years ago, and I don't know how these, your authors would handle the latest outbreak of Islamic terrorism. Uh, but your authors tend to downplay that, uh, that the robbing, the story of said there's no real evidence. Uh, folk, you can say there's no evidence for anything. What is significant, though, is that Europeans believe that Christian pilgrims were being robbed, including men like Peter the Hermit, who went and claimed he personally was robbed. Peter the Hermit did a lot to get the crusading spirit started. Now, so the Byzantine emperor, who realized the threat from the Muslims, called for help from Europe, saying, please come over here and help us fight these Muslims. So a crusading spirit developed where a lot of Europeans went and continued to go for about 200 years. The first crusade was the only one that was a success. Now we're going to talk about the crusades later. Um, we'll, I'll emphasize four of them. But the first crusade was a military success for the Europeans because they caught the Muslim world completely off guard. The Muslim world might have been expecting Mongolians to come in, or Turks, or whatever, but Europeans, the Muslim world was in a state of disunity, men fighting among themselves, and the Crusaders were able to capture the city of Jerusalem and set up a kingdom that lasted about 100 years. Then, Later Crusades were less successful. Finally, the Third Crusade lost the Holy Land. Well, actually, the Holy Land was lost before the Third Crusade, and the Third Crusade could not take it back. Uh, during the Second Crusade, the Christians still had the Holy Land, but they could not make any gains, and the Crusaders went home in defeat, or partially defeated. The Third Crusade, now, the Muslim world got a charismatic leader named Saladin. Now, Saladin has made news in modern times. Saddam Hussein claimed that he was descended from Nebuchadnezzar and Saladin. And, oh, he probably was. Here's why. I probably am descended from every European who was alive, who has any sense at all, European alive, who lived around 2,000 years ago. I mean, that must be half two parents, four grandparents, eight, 16, 32, 64, 120, 256. And it goes back by the time you get 30 generations or 900 years, you have more than a million ascendants. Assuming 30 years a generation, that is, that's which is average. You follow my math, follow the logic. Go back 2,000 years, and you're descended. If you have any European ancestry at all, you're probably descended from every European who was alive 2,000 years ago who has descendants, that is. So, I mean, all right, so for him to say that he was descended from Nebuchadnezzar who lived. 2,600 years ago, on some branch of family he probably was. As for Saladin, who had lived 900 years before, he probably was. I don't think you could document or prove it. But Saladin, he liked both men because Nebuchadnezzar <coughs> captured the Jews and carried them captive to Babylon, as I've already mentioned. And Saladin drove the Crusaders out of Judea also. He drove the Crusaders out of the Holy Land. So he was a great admirer of both men. Anyway, Saladin was a leader, 
And he was able to keep both sides happy, I might say. Every once in a while you get a man like that, who uh, everybody likes, can appeal to both sides. And uh, hey, in my own lifetime, there was a leader in the communist world named Tito, leader of Yugoslavia. Some of you might have heard of him, Tito, and he could keep Muslim and Roman Catholic Christian, Orthodox Christian, all into one unity. I mean, I don't know how he did it, but with his charisma, personality, whatever. Saladin was a lot the same. He could keep both sides of the Muslim world somewhat content. He drove them out. One of the greatest leaders Islam ever had. Too bad he could not have lived forever. Um, the Fourth Crusade wound up weakening the Byzantine Empire. Instead of fighting the uh, Muslims like was supposed to, it wound up turning on the Byzantine Empire and uh, captured and occupied Constantinople and did irreparable damage to the Byzantines. Then the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, and 9th Crusaders had less and less success. Then, in 1290, the last Crusade went, had no success whatever, but the Crusading fervor stopped in the year 1307 when the Black Death hit Europe and carried off a third of Europe's population, the plague was all over the known world. The bubonic plague, in fact, that's part of the bubonic plague. And um, the result was Europeans stayed at home for a time. Now I'm gonna jump forward in the history a little bit. All right, so Europeans did not capture the Holy Land at this time. Well, go forward a few hundred years European technology grows and grows. They develop better cannon, better ships, better gunpowder, better navigation techniques, while the Muslim world stayed still, thanks in large part to the Celtic Turks and the Ottoman Turks who discouraged innovation. And one after another, almost every Muslim country was conquered by a European country. Libya here, conquered by Italy. I mean, don't memorize this yet. I mean, you'll let it get it in second semester. Italy, Italy conquered by, I mean, by Italy conquered Libya. France conquered Algeria. Then France conquered much of the Sahara Desert. Great Britain conquered Egypt and Palestine. France conquered Iran and Iraq. Arabia was spared. Morocco was spared. But just about all this other part of the Islamic world was conquered. Now, Great Britain tried to conquer Afghanistan and couldn't, so uh, but some of the Islamic world escaped, but the Islamic world fell to the Europeans. Then came World War II, and after World War II, it became unfashionable to have colonies, so Europeans gave up all the colonies. And the result is what we see today. But uh, eventually, in other words, eventually, Europe got hold of these lands, only to give them up. Um, all right, we're going to talk more about the Crusaders later. Just uh, want to introduce to them, just let you know that they did happen. And to this day, Islam holds Europe responsible. In other words, basically the bad guys were the Europeans. Just like if you're a Islamic person, the bad guys are always the other fellow. And you're always right. Now, um, the, the Islam was invaded by another group called the Mongols, led by Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan came in during the 200-year crusading period of Europe's history, and uh, he uh, built what might be the largest empire the world has ever seen. Now, we're going to talk more about Genghis Khan again when we come to the chapter on China. Uh, chapter 11, I believe. Genghis Khan killed for the fun of it. He enjoyed killing. And he would go to these countries right here and just slaughter mercilessly. He conquered a lot of China. And if you can give him credit, I mean, he, uh, he, he said that his empire included all of this region here. Now granted, he probably did not have much control of this region here because there wasn't much here to control. But he claimed to hold all this, and if you can really give him credit for that, his empire was the largest empire that anyone ever built, including bigger than the United States, bigger than today's Soviet Union, uh, bigger than Canada. And of all the world conquerors, now I want to say about world conquerors, 
Dingus Columbus, the last one of them, I mean, uh, who uh, actually died at the head of his empire. More recently, Napoleon tried it and died a loser. Hitler tried it and died a loser. The Genghis Khan actually died at the head of his empire like Alexander the Great did and well, like Julius Caesar did. Genghis Khan is also the only one of them who can be said he truly started out in poverty and rose up by his own bootstraps. I mean, he was really, really poor when he started out. He was orphaned at the age of 10 and uh, wandered about from place to place, leading around just a few women who did not desert him when his father was poisoned. And when he grew up, he was able to unite all of Mongolia, something that had not been done in a thousand years, go down and conquer much of China, not all of it, and then go across the Himalayan mountains and uh, conquer much of the Muslim world. Again, one of the greatest conquerors of all time, um, like, again, like the Huns and like the Turks, they were brutal. But Genghis Khan's men, not Genghis Khan himself, now he never converted to Islam, but the people who came and, the Mongolians who came and settled in this part of the world converted to Islam. Otherwise, they too might have brought Islam to an end. But with the arrival, I mean, when the um, Ottoman Turks, what they built died down, but what Genghis Khan built kind of died down, the Muslim world was disunited and has remained disunited from that day to this. And they have spent the last 1,200, 1,100 years fighting each other. Now, folks, this is something every Muslim really knows. Islam would possibly have conquered the whole world except for one thing. They started fighting among themselves. And uh, this is still going on. Now, I mean, I'll give you an example. I mean, what's going on right in the world right now? Russia is against ISIS. Well, the United States is against ISIS. But then Russia is, ISIS is fighting Assad, the head of, of Syria. <clears throat> so the United States wants Syria, the, sorry, the United States wants Assad taken out of power. But Russia wants him in. So on the one hand, Russia is our friend because we're both fighting ISIS. On the other hand, Russia is our, is our enemy because Russia wants to keep Assad and the United States doesn't. This is a type of fighting that has been going on among the Muslim people for hundreds of years. One, on the one hand, they're on your side. On the other hand, they're against you. And it's difficult to tell who's on whose side at one point or another. Um, I got permission from my sister to tell this, but I'll tell it. I mean, this happened more than 40 years ago. When I was 18 years old, my 10-year-old and 8-year-old sisters got into a fight. Well, the 10-year-old was getting the best of the 8-year-old, and I didn't think this was quite fair, so I thought I'd intervene on behalf of the younger 8-year-old. And the next thing I knew, both of the girls were pounding on me. What did this have to do with the lesson? Quite a bit. This is what the United States has found itself involved in many, many a time when it's tried to intervene in some of the internal affairs of some of these Middle Eastern countries, or Latin American countries also. Same thing. To make both sides angry at you. All right. Now, there's so much for the political history. I mean, I want to sum up the political history in brief. Started out in Arabia, overspread to here, and uh, got much of, well, all the way over to Pakistan. Once a day, Iran, Iraq, and even made inroads into Spain, even though they eventually were driven out of Spain. They were stopped by the French here and could not make any headway by the French, into France. And in India, they were stopped. They got Pakistan, were stopped in India. And part of it was so they cannot fight very well in terrain where there's a lot of bushes and trees and mountains and uh, undergrowth. And uh, they simply they fight best in an open desert from horseback which is an obsolete way of fighting, but they, in those days, but they simply did not fight very well. When they came to a place like Spain or like India, um, they, they, their fighting ran out of steam. They were united for a time, then they were hit by the Crusaders from the west and by the Mongolians from the east. They managed to survive. They managed to convert the Mongolians the Turks and the Genghis Khan, some of Genghis Khan men, 
managed to convert them, did not convert the Europeans. This is basically the political history summed up in about a minute capsule. All right, now I want to get into something else about Muslim doctrine. What do Muslims believe? Now, I want to open up with a question for you. I did this the other class. Only one person actually responded. A lot of students have told me that they believe that the problem that the world's having is some, it's just a few isolated extremists, just a few extremists, who want to go and blow themselves up or get other people to blow up other people. And it's not, and really, it's on itself is not the problem. It's just the extremists. But every group has extremists. Well, Christians have, have been engaged in terrorism. Communists engaged in terrorism for a while. It's extremists. All right, I want to ask you a question. I mean, all right, several years ago, my daughter bought all the Harry Potter books. And in the Harry Potter, there's a passage about something worse than death. Worse than death. My daughter asked me, what can be worse than death? I spent a few years thinking about that. Which is worse, folk? For someone to strap a bomb themselves and blow you to a thousand pieces, or for someone, for you women, someone to tell you that you're a slave to your man, to a man, either your father or husband, which is worse. While you're thinking about that, which also is worse. Someone telling you that you have to join and worship in their mosque or blowing you to a thousand pieces. Which is worse. And down where you're going. Well, yeah, that's why it's on a spiritual level, yeah, where you're going. Both, I have to say that for a person to strap a boomer dog himself and go to a public place and up, it's not so bad compared to telling people for hundreds of years that they have to live a life where the women are slaves and everybody is a slave to somebody else. The younger brother is a slave to the older brother. The older brother is a slave to the father and the father is a slave to the local soldier and where freedom is unknown where the scientific and technological progress is unknown. They don't have it. If any of you want to disagree with that, you're welcome to. I won't argue with you. I'll like just say your piece. Worse than killing is slavery. That's why some of our founding fathers, like Patrick Henry, said, give me liberty or give me death. Um, it's a not just a slave enslavement of where that they work. It's an intellectual enslavement. It's intellectual enslavement as well as a spiritual enslavement. I want to repeat what I think I said last class. If Thomas Edison had been born in this part of the world, he would probably have invented nothing because these people have invented nothing in the last thousand years, that is. They did invent a few, we'll talk about some of the things they did invent before the year 1000 things that were very beneficial. They once were hey, they once were ahead of Europeans, scientifically and technologically, and in medicine and astronomy. They once were ahead. But like the race between a rabbit and a turtle, the rabbit went to sleep. And a turtle kept on going. They fell behind somewhere along the way. So again, is the problem then a few extremes? Or is the problem the religion itself. If I look fearful saying this, I mean, you're right, I really am. And if you're afraid to speak up, I don't blame you. The safest thing to do is sit back and be quiet. Yes? So what are some of the doctrines? Uh, I'll get to the doctrine. I mean, okay, one of the doctrines is, all right, here's one of the main doctrines that make them act like they do. They have no assurance of a happy afterlife. Even Mohammed once is known to have asked, when I die, I wonder if Allah will have me. There's one exception, there's one way they can be assured of a happy afterlife, and that is that they die in a jihad, in a holy war. So they believe, strongly believe, that if they strap arms to themselves and blow themselves to a thousand pieces and blow everybody else around them up, and take out as many people as they can and hurt them. This is a way 
to where they will have a paradise, they can learn to paradise and have, I've heard 70 and I've heard 72 virgins awaiting them. Most have probably heard the story about the virgins that await those who blow themselves to pieces and blow everybody else around them. Uh, they have, so this is one of the reasons that makes them act with you. They have no other assurance also in Islam. There is no real assurance, no real way to get forgiveness. Now, I've had a Muslim man question, I mean, call my hand, and he said, well, yes, Muslims believe you can get forgiven if you stop the sinning you're doing. Um, oh, let's face it, if you count every hateful thought you have and every lust you have a sin, and some one theologian has said we commit about 60,000 sins in a lifetime, or maybe more. And try as you might, you, if you think you're freeing yourself from your, you're fooling yourself. But they have no provision for forgiveness. And no assurance of the happy afterlife. Now this is something I cannot yet prove. I mean, I might look it up, but I have heard that Mohammed did not believe that women even had a soul. Therefore, women had no life in the afterlife. So probably you might say, what about the 70 virgins? Oh, they were created in the afterlife for the people who... Uh, deserved them, but they were not women who went to paradise when they died. That women had no, that women basically were no more than beasts and had no chance of a happy afterlife. Now this is not me teaching, you understand? This is what I've heard that Mohammed taught his followers. Um, he did teach for sure that women were property. Um, all right, then now is this hopefully will help explain why they act the way they do. They believe that it's their duty they keep on fighting and keep on fighting. Now, folk, one of my, I think I said this to another to this place. We fought some wars. We fought against the American Indians. And oh, they fought long and hard. But when they saw they were whipped, they quit. And when they quit, the white men quit. The Confederacy, ah, there was a long and bloody civil war, and half a million men lost their lives. When the Confederacy saw they were whipped, they quit fighting. All right. But these are people who never quit fighting. Now the Japanese, I mean, you know, they fought fanatically. But when we dropped two atomic bombs on two of their cities, their emperor told them, quit fighting, and they all quit. And they quit to this day. What, 70 years later? Uh, yeah, this, this, this makes 70 years. So 1945, 2015, 70 years, they quit fighting. But these people I'm talking about will never quit fighting. What do some people believe? They believe there's only one God. They, they call him Allah. Muhammad is his prophet. The holy book is the Quran. Now here comes the sticky point, folk. I mean, every religion has a, some holy sacred writings. Most religions have a prophet or a founder of sorts. Here comes the sticky point. Do they actually believe in spreading their religion by fire and sword? Now again, your authors downplay that, and they say, and I can quote your book, Muslims deny that they spread their faith by force. They deny the use of fire and sword. This was written, first written about 15 years ago when I first started teaching here. They may, they may have written it longer ago than that. And folk, again, I don't know how they would handle dealing with ISIS. ISIS definitely believes that the Muslim faith should be spread by fire and sword. Now, my question is, <clears throat> do Muslims really believe that they should spread their faith by fire and sword? The best answer I can give to that is, it depends on the time and the place. At some times, I mean, in a 1,400-year history, they have not, and at times they have. I talked to a young man from India one time who came to my class and he said, yes, they tried to swoop down to India and they converted the Pakistanis by fire and sword and he was certain of it. I did some research on it. It looks like in a lot of cases that's true. But it's not always true. Some of the rulers were tolerant and lenient and some of them were not. It depends on the ruler, it depends on the time, the places. So you cannot make a blanket statement. Did Mohammed advocate the use of fire and sword? Well, at the beginning, when he received his first revelation, I mean, he contradicted himself. He did not. He advocated persuasion. Then, two years before he died, he went to Mecca and converted the Meccans by force, by fire and sword, and he wrote in the Quran. And I want to quote this as best I can. I can't give you a chapter and verse, but 
kill the infidel. Do not hesitate to kill the persons who do not believe as we do. He strongly advocated the spreading of his religion by fire and sword. And when ISIS kills persons who do not convert, they're simply following the literal teachings of the Prophet Muhammad that he gave toward the end of his life. Now, if I'm wrong, the floor is open. Anybody can, anybody who wants to, can find it. I mean, I have a book, right? The book is the Quran. Yes. It's not supposed to be able to be translated, but let's face it, it has been translated at times into English. Well, yeah, I know. I've had friends who've read it. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll say this about the Islamic people. I want to say this in Islamic favor. Some of the most honest, morally upright people you meet are Muslim. So I wanted to mention, I don't have to say that. Some of the people who are more willing to help you, the kindest, gentlest people around, are Muslim. It's like Winston Churchill said, he noticed Islam had a very, I mean, he was enamored with him. Then he realized Islam has a dark side too. Now, for a time, folk, I was willing to embrace some of this. In Saudi Arabia, they don't have a very high murder rate. Why not? Because they execute murderers to cut off their heads with a sword in public, in plain view of everybody. This does a lot to deter murder. Muammar Gaddafi had a law on the book that if anybody stole, Christian or Muslim alike, he'd cut off their hand. Here's the good news, though. He never cut off a hand. Nobody's there stole. And I used to hate this was great. It's not so great. It guarantees a sheer lack of freedom, intellectual freedom, spiritual freedom, any kind of mobility, and guarantees that the societies and practices we cite. Now, I've talked to men who were in the army, based on the country, oh, this country over here, they don't have any problem with crime. Yeah, sounds great, but they don't make any scientific or intellectual progress either. There are people grow up, marry, die, bring up forth another generation, living the same old way, generation after generation, because they're afraid to venture out, step out, afraid to descend, afraid to disagree. I mean, to make a point, folks, I mean, I might be repeating what I said earlier, last time, but no Muslim is any harder against smoking tobacco than I am. And no Muslim is any harder against drinking alcohol than I am. I'll be right there. No Muslim is any harder against sexual immorality than I'm against it. But the difference is, I don't believe that these issues should be imposed on us by our government. They should be left at each individual, me and you, to decide for ourselves. Each of you and I can decide how much tobacco we smoke, even how much pot we smoke. Hey, I don't, I don't want to, I don't advocate smoking pot. All right, you first. Go ahead. Debbie. Um, just. Okay, this is a stupid question, but Muslim is a race, Islam is a religion, right? So uh, not no, every Muslim, Muslim is not a race. Muslim is a religion, Islam is a religion. Arab is a race. But they eventually started calling everybody who's Muslim Arabs. And this is in your book. That people who they conquered, once they converted, they start calling. So um, Arab is the only thing that can be called a race. Muslim is a religion. Islam is a religion. Arab is a race, but then it's become a religion of sorts. So what's the difference between Muslim and Islam? Different ways of saying the same thing. Different the difference between a car and an automobile. Different names too. Islam is the name of the religion, and Muslim is the people who follow the Islam. Oh, the people. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. So the name so of the religion is the people, people who follow people. it. Okay, there are no exact synonyms. All right, yes, you have something back here. Yeah, Could it be that Islam itself, the religion, is not evil, but that the rulers, people who use the religion for their purpose, um, uses, uses this? I, hey, you're not the first student I've had to ask you that same question. I, mean, I, I just tried to answer it uh, as best I could. I'm not going to repeat what I said. I mean, if, if you want to believe that, folks, you're welcome to believe it. I have to say, I think the problem, though, I mean, it's, it's not just the blowing up, but that's extremist, but it's the stifling of freedom. And this is basic to, I mean, the word Islam means you submit, submission to authority. Now, uh, 
And there was no freedom of dissent. So to me, the problem is not the extremists or the people who made it. The problem is the doctrine itself. I'm told if you think I'm hesitant to say that, I really can. Uh, in fact, I feel like I'm always going to have to apologize for saying it. But I just about have to say it because this is the way I see it. It's not the extremists. It's the doctrine. Okay, anybody, I'll be quiet. Anybody else? Do you have your hand up, no one? Um, okay, yes. So what's, what makes Islam really Christianity that respect? What is, what's that? What makes Islam really Christianity Different? Okay. Like Folk, in one word, liberty. One word. All right. I went, okay, folk. I want to quote. I mean, this is a state school. But all the same, I mean, I'm supposed to have freedom. I want to quote the New Testament. The Apostle Paul, he said, some people believe they should observe special days as holy days. Other people esteem all days alike. The person who wants to observe the day should not judge the other person who doesn't want to observe them. Let everyone make up his own mind what he believes. He also said, everything I want to do is lawful for me, but I'm not going to be put under the power of anything. All right. This, I mean, if you want me to give chapter and verse, I give chapter. Most of you might not even know those passages are in there, but they are there. Let the person who wants to eat meat, eat meat. And if you don't eat meat, don't you judge the person who does. And if you do eat meat, don't judge the person who doesn't. That's the end of Paul's writings. So you're free to make up your own mind about these issues that separate, and that's what separates us from them in one word, yes. So what about, like, South America? About what? South America. South America? A lot of us were taught, uh, like, even in my opinion, they were taught that communism was, like, justified in the Bible, and they used that for, I mean, look at the guy who, uh, uh, they, uh, tell people, like, they used religion to lead a lot of our groups that way, and we have wars. I have talked about South America, and I want to say one thing about South America. For many, many years, now they're getting better at that, but they united church and state. Church and state were one just like Islam. There's no separation of mosque and state in Islam. South America was the same way. And I mentioned that in one of the tests I gave, that persons who unite church and state are going to wind up having these kinds of problems. Now, South America, with all due respect, I understand lately it's getting much, much, much better about that, but they, they did not separate church from state. Church and state were one and the same. And the result was extreme poverty that was difficult to overcome, as well as one uprising after another, one upheaval after another, one government being overthrown after another, attempts at democracy that failed. Uh, you probably know more about that than I do, but this went on in Latin America. But today, Latin America is much more stable. They also have much of, more of a distance church and state, which I think is good. Hear that from the church? Yeah. Church and state should be separate. Yes. <clears throat> Talking about um, like liberty in like Christian yeah. um, state or Islamic state. I just came back from Dubai and um, Dubai is super liberal compared to you know what you would perceive by Islamic state to be. Yeah. Um, and I am not familiar with it, like, regrettably. I mean, you know, there's uh, I'm not that familiar with that particular part of the world. Okay. And even technology-wise, they're, I would say they're more advanced than the United States. Yeah, they might be. All right. Well, I see a couple of heads nodding. All right. I am not familiar with it, regrettably. Um, if they're more advanced, if you think they're more advanced in the United States, you're welcome to say that here. Um, yeah. All right. Um, Yes. I mean, religion obviously affects the the society and everything. Oh yes, yeah, quite advancement, a bit. Whatever. But for me, like religion is um, like what what are what do you believe to be true? And just because someone believes that thing to be true, I mean, it's true. To some extent, everybody has a worldview. I mean, we call it worldview now. I mean, atheism is a worldview. And I've heard people say atheism is a religion. And I had someone say, hey, communism is not a religion. Well, they believe in the inevitability of them taking over the world. So to me, that's religion. 
if you believe in anything that's inevitably, that they're going to triumph. Well, I, all religions believe that their religion is going to eventually triumph. Um, evolution is a religion. It cannot prove what it says. I mean, it was not observed for it. Uh, and um, therefore, you cannot duplicate it either. I mean, so if it's not, if it cannot be observed, it cannot be replicated in a lab, um, then it's hard to call it a true science. So it's a philosophy. <coughs> philosophy, religion, the two areas overlap. Um, all right, anybody else? I mean, this morning's class, they listen, but they, none of them take part. All right, yes, Jamie. talk a little bit about that. Um, what have the Arabs actually invented? Now folks, there are three things that they invented. Before, sorry, I say. Um, all right, we've talked a little bit about Rome and Roman numerals. I want you to see, here's a math problem. Divide five into, and you get, does anybody know how I did that? No, I faked it. You cannot do division with Roman numerals. All right, let's add three plus, and you get, yeah, three plus four equals seven. How did I do that? Again, folk, I faked it. You really cannot do addition with Roman numerals. So where, here is a big contribution that should have sent the Islamic people to the moon generations ago. They invented Arabic numerals. Which is what we are using when we do our arithmetic, when we write numbers. The one numbers one, two, three, they're Arabic numerals. And in addition, <coughs> they invented the number zero. Now zero is actually a number. In fact, it's the most important number of all numbers. It's the central point of all numbers. Numbers start with zero and they go in two directions. Positive one, positive <coughs> two, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. Out from the number zero. Numbers go in two directions, beginning at zero. Very important. Without, with the number, with the Arabic numeral system and with the number zero, you can teach nine-year-olds how to do long division. Their advances in arithmetic 
led to the invention of algebra, an Iranian mathematician in the 800s invented algebra. Algebra invented, but see, they, they, they invented algebra and then stopped. Well, they should have gone on from algebra. I mean, they taught Europeans algebra, then Europeans invented trigonometry, calculus, and the other mathematical branches that branch off from algebra. But you have to start with algebra. The advanced mathematics starts with algebra. Now, do any of you know what I'm talking about? Maybe if a couple, well, at least one head is nodding, like you understand. You have to know algebra in order to learn trigonometry. You have to learn algebra before you can learn calculus and some of the other branches of mathematics. It starts with algebra, folk. Without algebra, we're lost. All right, they started, these inventions, by the way, were all invented before the year 1000. After the year 1000, it's hard to find anything that they've invented. Now, one thing they gave to the world in the field of literature is the stories about the Arabian Nights. Any of you read about uh, Alabama and the 40 Thieves? It's one of the stories. Um, Aladdin and the Magic Lamp, the lamp that he could rub and would make a wish and everything. If you've read those stories, they come from the Arab world. Uh, I'm trying to think of a few other. Uh, but anyway, Alabama and the 40 Thieves, and where the password was open sesame after the sesame seed. Um, yeah, there was about a thousand and one stories that supposedly were told. Some of the more famous ones are the better ones that reached us. Big contribution to world literature, but in a field, I mean, uh, in a field of science, technology, politics, they have managed to invent practically nothing in the last thousand years. Now again, this might, I mean, it's up to you to decide whether this is a reflection on their religion or not. Um, they are really bothered by the fact that technology passed them by and went to Westerners instead of them. I mean, it upsets them. And also, I want to say this on Mohammed's behalf, he did favor, he did advocate scientific inquiry and scientific investigation. So what happened? Well, after he got gone, I'll be right. After he got gone, a couple things. Number one, the Seljuk Turks came in and they stifled any kind of inquiry or dissent. You have to have freedom of dissent, folks, to have scientific advances. It's simply you have to allow people to disagree with you in order to advance scientifically. It's a must. I mean, hey, when Robert Fulton put together a steamship, they called it Fulton's Folly, and they laughed at him until he got it to working. Then they all stopped laughing. There was a man named Colonel Drake. No, he was not a colonel. Colonel was somehow his first name. He drilled for oil. He believed that oil was underground in veins and could be gushed up. He could just tap a vein. It was called Drake's Folly. He drilled and drilled until one day the oil gushed up. Got him all soaked with oil. And the other person who was drilling with him got he was paying two dollars a day, which was a big wage back then. The year was 1890 something. He drilled for oil and got it to gush up. And without that oil, we would not have the automotive automotive world we have today. The buses, the cars, the trains, the planes, the ships. There's not enough whales in the ocean to keep all that going. He was called Drake's Folly. The Wright brothers were told that they could never get a heavier than air machine off the ground, so they did. They dissented. You must allow dissent. Well, that's why this paper that I've had you look at as a sample was written by a Muslim man from another school. He talks like it's so awful when one of our senators will disagree with our president. I think I'm repeating myself. So my wife disagrees with me sometimes. And oftentimes I'm better off for it. Because sometimes her idea is better than mine. Not all the time, but it does happen. Um, and I would, as soon as she said, oh, yeah, I should have thought that. You, know, you have to allow freedom to dissent if you're going to have any kind of scientific progress. Um, all right. Now, um, Regrettably, I mean, the, after these inventions, algebra, the Arabic numerals, and the zero, they, um, they got to where they didn't invent much 
in, um, in modern times, um, in the last thousand years, in fact. And again, it bothers them. Now, one other thing that happened to them, I read this one time, and I can believe it. Eventually, their science began to conflict with their theology. And I hope this is true of every religion, including Christianity, where the science seems to make discoveries that conflict with your religious beliefs. What do you do? I say, let the scientific progress march on. Here's why. Science changes drastically. The idea that the Earth was the center of the universe put forth by Ptolemy, you know, Ptolemy was the ruler of Egypt, Cleopatra was the last of the Ptolemies, put forth in one of the Ptolemies that the Earth's center of lasted in European science for 1,800 years. Then along came Copernicus, he said, no, the Earth is not the center, and it he was persecuted eventually. The Europeans began to accept, yeah, the Earth is not the center of the universe. Okay, now, so we went one direction, turned around and went the other direction. But then, folk, we got even more knowledge. We got to looking into heavens and got to develop the Hubble Space Telescope. And God said, now, where is the center of the universe? Where is the center? Now, we have two answers to that that we can give. Number one is anywhere you are in the universe is going to appear to be the center, which if you believe that, that's fine. It's all this. It looks like it might be true. Or the other argument is our own solar system is in fact the center of the universe like the ancients always said it was. And mathematically folks you can't argue against everywhere we look it looks like the universe is equally divided with us in the center. Again, we started off believing one thing, turned and went the other way, and then turned right back around and went the way we started. We used to believe, oh yeah, the Sun rotates around the earth, goes around the earth every day. Then along came Copernicus and Galileo and said, no, the earth actually turns, spins around on its axis. Then along came Einstein and he said, all motion is relative anyway, so if you want to believe the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, it's observation, you know, plain old observation. Well, you can because all motion is relative anyway. So we went one way, turned around and went the other way, and then went back. In the field of medicine, I, when I was a kid, they taught us, don't take herbs. Uh, our primitive ancestors, the witch doctors, and uh, you know, the old doctors used to dig up herbs and try to find cures through herbs. Then we got more enlightened and we abandoned herbs. But then we got more enlightened still. And guess where we're in grace? We got to wind up believing in herbs again. Do any of you know what I'm talking about? Now be careful taking herbs, folks, because they can damage your kidneys, they can damage, uh, they can do a lot of damage to your health, cripple you up, make you walk with a cane before you're 60. Uh, and a lot of persons have found out the hard way. Be careful. They have benefits and they have drawbacks, and we're just now beginning to find a drawback. But herb, herbal medicines has made a huge comeback. Again, science can go one direction today and turn right around and go the opposite direction tomorrow. Um, all right, but again, the Islamic people do not realize this, so they, they, they when their science conflict with religion, they abandoned science and embraced the religion. Christians fought over the issue with science winning, for, their, for better or for worse. But again, science winds up changing its tune pretty often. Have I seen science change its tune? Yes, and here of medicine, ulcers. When I was a kid, ulcers were caused by overwork and stress. Now we realize ulcers are caused by bacteria and be cured by antibiotics. And the doctor who initially discovered it was fought against at first. Then he proved his case and today if you go to a doctor and he diagnoses with ulcers, you'll probably treat with antibiotics. That was unthinkable 40 years ago. One big change, I mean there are others. numerous changes have been made. Again, they should not have feared that science would conflict with the theology, but they did, and again, that did a lot to stifle them. Now, I want to say, 21st century America, now, most of you, the class this morning did not know, most of you probably did not know that prayer rooms in public schools are actually legal if they are Muslim. Christians are not allowed. Now, here's the story, folks. 
I mean, oh, my wife met one of the pupils back when I was teaching at a college near my home. My wife bumped into a pupil, oh yeah, you're Mrs. Cunningham, but well, we I had your husband, and she told him that he wanted to get discussion going, but most of the class was on talk. That's typical. Then he said, we did not believe him when he told us that there were prayer rooms, Muslim prayer room in public schools, so we looked it up. Where are they located in places like New York, Michigan, California? Now, folk, here's the, here's the catch-22. It is legal for Christians in public schools to form Youth for Christ class and hold meetings after school, and the only cost the taxpayers, they might decide, let's meet in Mr. Daniels' math class at 4.30 after school. This is legal. And they can recruit members, and you know they call themselves Youth for Christ, they have a sponsor, and the only cost of taxpayers is they might turn the lights on while they're meeting. That's it. Muslim prayer rooms cost hundreds of thousands because they have to, number one, have two of them, one for the men and one for the women. They have to lay out special carpet and have to have plumbing because Muslims have to form a cleansing ceremony called ablutions before they pray. And the prayer rooms have to be oriented toward Mecca. All of this at the expense, and most Americans do not know what's going on. And what do the liberals say against it? Not one word. If you don't believe it, folks, look it up. Muslim prayer rooms, public schools, and you'll be taken to several websites. Yes? Yeah, but other religions have every, uh, certain things. Like, most churches don't have to pay for taxes. In Jewish schools, they have Jewish holidays that they can get. Um, churches don't have to pay for taxes. No. Churches do not pay taxes. That is right. The churches do not pay taxes. Now, there are some cases where, the, like, if a church rents out its parking lot, that's considered a business. They pay taxes on the revenue they collect from that. From, from revenue from offerings is not taxed. Uh, this is, <clears throat> yes, well, there's a difference, folks. I mean, to me, a big difference. No church should be allowed to put a chapel of any kind on a public elementary or high school, even at church expense. Whereas these Muslims get hundreds of thousands of dollars from state governments and local governments <clears throat> at taxpayer expense. Now, if you don't see the inconsistency of it, I do. Yes. But the schools that make you say the Pledge of Allegiance. No, they don't. It's illegal to force anyone to say the pledge. Well, now, now. Yeah, it used to be. All right, it used to be when the Americans were more united, they could require it. But the Supreme Court ruled against it. That the pledge, you cannot force anyone to say the pledge. Um, folk, again, if you might not see the inconsistency of it, I do. Um, Now, right now, right at this moment, there is a man, a high school football coach, who went out the 50-yard line voluntarily and set a prayer on the 50-yard line. Eventually, some of his teammates joined him, strictly voluntary. Then it got so that the other teams joined. This coach is about to be fired. If this coach had been a Muslim, the folk, if I'm telling him wrong, you can tell me from face I'm wrong. If he had been a Muslim, there would not have been one word said he gets it. Yes. But there is this uh, famous football player who's a Christian who yeah. after every touchdown he would pray. Yeah. yeah he got Muslim, kicked off the team. Yeah, but a Muslim person did that and now he's being sued. I did not realize that. But, but he's not being uh, he's, I'm sure he's not being sued by the government. Um, yeah. Um, the Christian guy got like many followers, just a whole bunch of He got but he also got fired from his team, if you think the same man I am. Yeah, he can't find a team. It was never good. No, I'm not going to name names. Now, I don't know about the Muslim case. But, but basically, okay, well, even if that's true, the Muslim man, he should not be sued, just like the Christian man should be allowed to pray the point he wants to. Yes. It depends on, all right, you don't have a problem if there's no one in the community who, who will complain. But I mean, I work for five and a half at public school. Everything depends on who complains. Now, all right, I'll tell you, there was a case where that our head coach turned around and slapped one of our better players on the back of the head. He got away with it because he quickly apologized. No one, his parents did not complain. I mean, the, the coach he liked it. Basically what happened was someone, we were ahead 24 to nothing and the game was over and someone on the other team came and he cussed this player up and he just cussed right back 
than God himself. Guess what? The officials tossed our guy out and left him in, and our coach turned him and slapped him on the back of the head, and the official called 15 yards against us for unsportsmanlike conduct, even though I can verify it. The other team started it, but nevertheless, we were the ones who got But our coach, oh, he couldn't have called. I said, now listen, Cole. I said, Dennis, I'm really sorry I slapped you. Uh, it could have cost coach a job, but his parents did not complain. Again, folk, and I ran into the same thing. It depends on who complains. Um, all right. Hey, um, anybody else? Now, unlike this morning's text where nobody would talk, at least most of you participated, and now one of you went to sleep, but most everybody else appears to be attentive in a way. <laughs> but one of you did zonk out. All right. Yeah, all right. All right, anyway, to the rest of you, hey, thank you. You're awake and alert. All right, um, anything else? Now, folks, in, in any war, there is going to be bad on both sides. That's not to say that we are always right. There's going to be bad on both sides. Um, I don't agree with everything our government does, and also in the conflict I mentioned between Syria and Assad, or between this ISIS and the Russia. Hey, I'm against ISIS. Maybe if most of the Americans are. And but in the case of getting rid of Assad, I'm against that too. And for once, I find myself in a conflict between a potential conflict between the United States and Russia, actually sympathetic toward Russia against my own country. Why? We got rid of Muammar Gaddafi. We thought he was bad, and the result was chaos broke out. We got rid of Saddam Hussein. We thought he was bad, and the result was chaos broke out. And I'm afraid if we get rid of Hassan, things are going to be worse than they are now. Yes? You didn't think we should have got rid of Saddam Hussein? Well, okay, ever since he left, all right, hindsight has pointed to Ever since he left, if Saddam Hussein could have kept ISIS down, he did. Ever since he left, there's but been nothing but trouble and turmoil and chaos endless in that area. Now, if I'm wrong, tell me. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. We don't know if he, okay, say we didn't kill Saddam Hussein, ISIS could have still broke out. He kept that, he kept that his people pretty much in check. No. Well, he would have well. died eventually. Right. And then ISIS would have still broke back. Okay. So it's like, well, oh, terrorists are going to be terrorists. To me, to me, we were better. The country was better off while he was around than it is now. Okay, go ahead. But Saddam Hussein started off in America. He did. He did start off what? He started off here. Yeah, he started off here. Yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't start off in the, he was yeah. always yeah. a great yeah. Iraqi. Yeah. I believe. He was always Iraqi, but he was part of the, Oh, well, yeah, here's the thing. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, not only is it all the same, but for some of it not, it started off as our friend. These people become your friend one day and your enemy the next. And they go, they're on your side today and on the other side tomorrow, and it's difficult to tell which side they're on. Uh, again, folks, you, you can disagree if you want to, but I still kind of think that if we get rid of the sod, we're going to get something worse than Spider. I mean, how about we get human? We got rid of Batista, and guess what? We got Castro. We got rid of Chiang Kai Shek, and got Mayor Zedong. We got rid of Tsar Nicholas, and we got Lenin, Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev. You, you, might, you might see, but some of you you get rid of a bad apple, and you get a worse apple. Yes, you got something on yeah. We might get something worse. All right, listen, we have a couple minutes left. Yes. Okay, part of that part that's the four, please. Back in the back. Part, right. go ahead. The thing is with, like, uh, Saddam Hussein uh, and some of the other dictators, yeah. whereas you might not like them because they're dictators, they still stabilize the region. And as soon as they fell, those destabilized. You are saying 100% what I've been trying to say in the last few minutes. They, sometimes the only type of stability you can have comes through a dictator. But democracy much too often leads to chaos, and we're seeing that in this country. I mean, hey, Singapore. They got so bad in Singapore, you could not even walk the streets without getting 30 men together, and all 30 of you trying to get to the supermarkets. Hopefully you can get there without being mugged. Then Lu Yan took over. And Lu Yan was the best dictator you could have. He whipped, and it was with a cane, the bad guys. The good guys had nothing to fear. I mean, hey, the good guys, which is 90% of us, 
could all of a sudden, even the women could walk the streets at night. But he made the bad guys either change their ways or leave Singapore. And one American tried to act bad in Singapore, and he got caned four times with a bamboo shoot. Michael Fay was his name. Some of you might have heard of the incident. And the Singapore people just love it. But he got order. Doing things. Now, which brings me to the next and last point, folk. We are not going to be able to win the war against terror fighting within the confines of our own morality, fighting within the confines of political correctness. When Abraham Lincoln won the Civil War, he won it by suspending the Constitution, by jailing people for, who disagreed with him. Woodrow Wilson jailed people who disagreed with him, and he won. Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill did the same thing, and they won. We did not dis jail dissenters in the Vietnam War, and they lost. We're going to have to fight them somewhat on their terms, and they don't fight me. They have, ISIS has fought the 7th century up to the 21st century, and it taught us how that wars used to be fought. Folk, the Confederacy, one of the reasons the Confederacy lost the Civil War, they tried to fight clean. And General Sherman came through and burned the state of Georgia, burned the state of Atlanta to the ground. If you don't like what I'm saying, I'm sorry, I don't like it either. But it's the way wars are fought, and we are not capable of fighting dirty anymore. We criticize our grandfathers for imprisoning <coughs> those poor little innocent Japanese, and we would never do that again. No, we're not going to do it until they dirty bomb one of our cities and kill a million of our folks. And then, maybe, we'll change. Maybe. After it's too late. Don't think they're not capable of doing it. They're capable and their morality is so low that they will, in fact, do it to us. And we're going to sit by and let them. Okay, time is up. Hey.